Good morning, everyone. Good to see some few joint class. Uh, maybe the others will join, but we'll begin. So can, um, can one of you please lead us in prayer? Anyone? You want to like to lead us in prayer? Can we pray? Sure, Charles. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning. We are really thankful to you that you can even connect us. Thank you for the connectivity. Thank you for the gadgets and the internet and everything. Lord, we pray that you will keep it up. You will you will maintain the internet connectivity and that even other people that are yet to join in you will be able to join and Lord that whatever you have prepared for us to study we will be able to study it for the glory of your name and the goodness of your church in Jesus name we pray and believe amen amen thank you Charles uh, am I amen. clear and audible is there clarity in the my voice, the audio. You are okay, even the video is nice. Sorry, Charles. You are okay, even the video is nice. Okay, the video is nice, but uh, uh, am I loud enough? Okay, Kennedy says yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll begin class. Um, last week we were looking at uh, uh, a little bit, uh, bit about the introduction to the uh, Epistle of Romans, and we began looking at uh, chapter one. Okay, we looked at chapter one, verse one, and in that we saw about uh, how Paul introduces himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ, something that he chooses. And uh, he also mentions that uh, he is chosen by God as an apostle, and he has been separated um, to the gospel of God. And we dwelt quite a bit on the meaning of uh, what he meant by the gospel of God. So Paul understands the gospel of God in a very comprehensive um, way. Uh, and for him, you know, the gospel of God is not just something for us like, you know, it's something that we share with sinners as a way of salvation. But for him, it is um, the message of God. Uh, it's the gospel of the message of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel or message which is preaching. Uh, and it's the gospel or message which brings peace in the lives of people. It's also a gospel that Paul says is my gospel, which is something very personal, which he has received for himself. Okay, now we'll move on to verse 2. He says, uh, uh, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, uh, which he promised here is talking about the gospel. So the gospel, which was promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So we see that the gospel is not just in the New Testament, but the gospel is something that was there in the Old Testament. It was proclaimed by the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, Paul is saying that the, the gospel that he is preaching, uh, this message of good news was uh, already promised in the Old Testament through the prophets. Um, and he notice how he mentions about the Old Testament. He doesn't say Old Testament, but we are referring, he just mentions this as Holy Scriptures. But we know that, you know, the prophets were mentioned in the Old Testament. But look at how uh, and what he mentions about the Old Testament. He mentions the Old Testament as the Holy Scriptures. So we see uh, Paul's regard for the Old Testament, that it was not just the Old Testament that you know we refer to as Old Testament, but he refers to it as Holy uh, Scriptures. So I think that is what we need to be also mindful of, that you know, the Old and the New Testament is not just something that God has given to us, but it's Holy Scripture, it's God breathed, it's God's holy words. 
Okay, so in the Old Testament, the prophets were promising of the good news that was coming, and that coming uh, they were pointing out was uh, towards the coming of uh, Jesus. So we see it was too Paul's understanding that the gospel uh, we are preaching is not something that is new, uh, but it was something that is spoken of in the Old Testament, and we see Paul's heart for the Old Testament that for him it was not just Old Testament or law or the Torah, but it was uh, the Holy Scriptures. Verses 3 and 4, can somebody read verses 3 and 4, please? Romans 1, verse 3 and 4. Okay. Concerning, his son, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born, of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection, resurrection from the dead. Okay, thank you, uh, Mangi. So the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Uh, in relation to Jesus Christ, Paul mentions two things here. In the natural, that is according to the flesh, he came as a descendant of David. And why is he mentioning it here? It's important because it was the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies. The Old Testament prophecies were talking about the root of David, the offspring of David. Uh, they were pointing to someone coming in the line of David. And hence Paul is saying uh, all that the prophets spoke about or pointed about, that is Jesus. And that is Jesus because he is the seed of David. So he's mentioning about the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies in terms of the natural according to the flesh. He came as a descendant of David. But who was who truly was Jesus? He was the Son of God. And how do we know that? Because he came with power in the spirit of holiness and he was raised from the dead. Okay. So how do we know that? Um, Jesus was truly the Son of God. Uh, two things is because he came with power and he came with the, the spirit of holiness, uh, you know, uh, and he was raised from the dead. Okay, now notice how he speaks about the Holy Spirit. He refers to the Holy Spirit as a spirit of holiness. Okay, and we too need to think about the Holy Spirit as a spirit of holiness. Sometimes when we use the phrase Holy Spirit, uh, we use it just like, you know, any other, like someone's name. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is just, just not like any other name that we almost commonly use every day. But uh, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Holiness. Uh, so when we use the Holy Spirit as uh, a name that we use commonly, like just like any other name, then the whole meaning of the name of the Holy Spirit and who he uh, is and what, who he signifies, his attributes, his nature is completely uh, lost. Now for us, the Holy Spirit can just mean the name of the Spirit of God. It can mean the person of the Trinity or uh, it can just mean uh, the person in the Godhead. Um, and so the title just comes very easily uh, for us. But when we turn it around and say the Spirit of Holiness, it actually causes us to pause and to think it. It just gives such a greater weightage and meaning when we say the spirit of holiness. Because when, when we talk of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the spirit of holiness. Um, not only is he holy, but his presence is holiness. That is why we say spirit of holiness. That means uh, not only as a person, as his nature, his attributes is holy, but his very presence is holy. Holiness. You know, um, when we do church or when we come together as a church, uh, you know, the sense of holiness is 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 many times or often lost. Or uh, there is no sense of the awe of God. And uh, we speak so much about the Holy Spirit. We welcome Him. Uh, you know, uh, but we do it with the least sense of holiness or, or regard for who He is. Uh, you know. Uh, 
when but when we when we call upon the holy spirit or when uh, when we do church you know there should be a sense of consecration a sense of holiness uh, we walk in because we are saying the spirit of holiness come we're saying spirit of holiness move among us we're saying a spirit of holiness work among us so when we have when we stand in awe and regard uh, of who god is you know uh, it also manifests uh, in and through our worship, in and through our lives, and we can uh, experience the full extent of who God is and what He does in our um, presence. Now, this is just a side thought about the Holy Spirit, but the main thought that Paul is actually uh, bringing about here is that uh, Jesus Christ, who was proclaimed, announced, and revealed as the Son of God, uh, is uh, is is reveal as the Son of God uh, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So the main thought here is that Jesus Christ was proclaimed, announced, revealed as the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit who reveals the person and work of Jesus Christ's power and by the resurrection from the dead. So there are two things here, the Son of God with power and the Son of God by resurrection from the dead. So both point to Jesus as the Son of God. So he's establishing who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, first, he uh, he establishes the um, uh, you know uh, uh, the natural the natural realm according to the flesh that he was a descendant of David, thus fulfilling all the prophecies uh, that were written about him in the Old Testament. And also, he is talking about the greater and the bigger aspect of Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, and he's saying he's the Son of God because he's the Son of God with power and the Son of God by resurrection from the dead. Uh, both pointing out to Jesus as uh, the Son of God. In verse five says through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name so paul is saying here that through christ we have received grace and apostleship okay as a side note um we uh, you know just want to mention that there is grace and there is apostleship now apostleship has to do with commission it has to do with mission uh, that God gives us. Now, grace is God's empowering over our life to fulfill the commission, to fulfill the mission, to fulfill the work that God gives us. Okay, so the two things, grace and apostleship. Apostleship has to do with commission, it has to do with the, the mission that God gives us, and grace is God's empowering us uh, in our life to fulfill the commission, the work of the mission that God has entrusted to us, or God has given to us. Now, this is a common way uh, Paul talks about his ministry. Uh, he says, through Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. Um, so what is the commission that God has given us? Uh, we have been given the commission to bring people in obedience to the faith in Christ Jesus in all the world and that is what he's mentioning in verse 5 so what is the commission that god has given us the commission that god has given us is we are to bring people in obedience to the faith uh, in jesus christ in all the work okay so the work we are doing or the work we have is the work we have been given from god uh, and we have his grace to empower us to do this work that he has given us. And what is the work? The work is to make people to come in obedience to the faith in Jesus Christ in all the uh, world. Okay? Now Paul uses uh, the phrase in obedience to the faith in other places as well. We see this phrase, we read about this phrase in Romans chapter 15, verse 18, uh, where Paul says, uh, when he's talking about making Gentiles obedient to the faith through signs, wonders, and miracles. He also mentions about this phrase, obedience to the faith in Romans chapter 16, verse 26, where he, uh, here he refers to people coming to the obedience to the faith so coming to the faith is coming to a place of 
uh, obedience. Okay. Now, obedience to the faith uh, is not emphasized uh, when we say, "Come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved from your sin," or "Come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be blessed," or when we say, "Come to Jesus Christ, and you will be healed," or "Come to Jesus Christ, and you will be set free." But Paul is looking at this phrase as obedience to the faith, as coming to obedience. It's uh, it, it means it, it's coming to a place when you surrender and submit all of your self. It's coming to a place of giving up your freedom uh, to obey Christ. Uh, you know, and this is something we need to make clear when we need, when we are preaching the gospel that. Um, Coming to the faith in Jesus Christ is not just for our sins to be saved. Yes, all of that is inclusive. You know, coming to Jesus Christ for sins to be saved, coming to the faith in Jesus Christ and you will be blessed, come to the faith in Jesus Christ and you will be healed, you will be set free. Yes, all these are different aspects. But the major aspect, the main truth of coming to the obedience to faith is coming to a place of total submission and total surrender, total obedience, coming to a place where we are giving up our own freedom and obeying um, Christ. And this is what, uh, you know, we need to make clear even as we preach the gospel. So when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you know, you're coming to a place of obedience to Christ. That is why, you know, when we receive salvation, sorry, when we receive salvation, you know, we're saying, uh, we're making Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Okay. Uh, Savior means, you know, uh, he saved us from our sins. And that is what most of us, you know, as uh, uh, give preference to that aspect, but you know, most of us don't make him Lord of our lives, where we don't give him the lordship uh, of our lives, so we don't submit and surrender our entire being, uh, our wills, our emotions, our passions, our desires uh, to him, and that is what God wants us. You know, He wants us to be, uh, wants us to make him Lord and. Uh, savior and so you know um, coming to a place of obedience is saying lord i'm following you and you alone for the rest of my life um, and uh, saying you know uh, this is where i want to be god totally surrendered totally submitted uh, to you this is where god wants us to be this is where he wants us to come to yes there's healing blessing forgiveness when we come to faith in jesus christ but coming to faith in jesus is in Jesus Christ is basically coming to the obedience to Christ. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, verses um, uh, six and seven. So, can somebody read verses six and seven, please? Quickly, verses six and seven. Can I read? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Among whom you also are the call. Are as the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. So here um, Paul is saying that the believers uh, of God have been given a call and commission to preach his good news among all nations. Paul is saying that as a believer, he has been given this call, he's been given this commission uh, to preach the good news among all nations. And he's telling uh, the other believers that he's writing to that you are also part of that. Uh, you are also called of Jesus Christ. You have also been brought to a place of obedience to the uh, faith. So from verses 1 to 6, uh, we see um, Paul is saying that he's a born servant of Jesus Christ. He was called and separated. He's basically talking about who he is. Then he goes on to say what he's proclaiming. He's saying he's proclaiming a message uh, that was proclaimed by the prophets in the Old Testament, which is the Holy Scriptures. And it's a message about Jesus Christ who was declared to be the Son of God with power and by resurrection. And then Paul was, goes on to mention what he is doing, uh, that he is doing this by the grace and the commission that God has given them him. And then uh, we see uh, he talks about his objective. What is his objective? Is to bring people in all the nations to be obedient uh, to the faith. Now, verse 7 onwards, he goes on to mention why he's writing to the 
uh, Romans, why he is writing to the church or why he is writing to the believers at uh, uh, Rome. Okay, um, in verse seven he mentions that. So it's always interesting in Paul's letter uh, to see how he looks at the people of God. Okay, so here he says to all who are in Rome, beloved of God called to be saints. Very interesting how Paul looks at the people of God. Uh, what is our view of uh, the church or believers, uh, you know, when we see them, you know, uh, uh, what do we think of them? It's very interesting that uh, Paul sees uh, other believers as people of God, beloved of God, and the people who are called to be uh, saints. So do we look at, uh, you know, other believers, uh, our church members in this way? Do we look uh, at them as beloved of God? Uh, do we look at them uh, as saints? Or, you know, when we look at them, we're constantly reminded about their sins, uh, how they live, how they behave, their attitudes, uh, you know, if they're proud, if they're arrogant. Uh, but it's important that we can learn from this that we need to look at people of God as those who are beloved of God, those who are called uh, to be um, saints. Uh, it's so beautiful to see how Paul looks at the people of God. And as beloved of God, Paul is saying, uh, telling the church and the believers at Rome that you're deeply loved by God. You are special to God. You are called to be only one. So he's just reminding them of their identity and who uh, yeah, they are. And uh, we also learn that this is the way that, you know, uh, we need to look at uh, the believers in our church. We need to look at the people of uh, uh, God. Okay. Uh, here also we see, you know, um, how, how do we be perceive believers in church? How do we speak of them? You know, uh, some of us who serve at church, who minister at church, how do we believe, uh, perceive believers how do we uh, speak of them and we can learn from paul that you know he chooses uh, to see people as beloved people of god those who are called to be holy those who are called to be saints now when we uh, look at people in this way you know it gives us a totally different perspective and a mindset uh, a totally different uh, attitude in which we can relate to them or how we will behave to them how we will regard them and how we will worship together in unity and oneness because god uh, chooses to dwell in unity and oneness he chooses that his people be one like he is uh, which he mentions in his high priestly prayer in john chapter uh, 17. And then Paul goes on to say, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is just like uh, uh, well wishes that he is giving, just like we know, we just uh, wish people, bless them, uh, you know, just give them our well wishes. The same way, this is uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just some well wishes that uh, Paul is, uh, uh, you know, um, wanting to um, share with the believers of the church at Rome. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 8. Can somebody read that please? Romans chapter 1 verse 8. Eight and verse 9 as well. Can somebody read that? Romans chapter 1, 8 and 9. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So he goes on to talk about how he is praying for the believers um, at Rome. So he says, first he offers a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, he is thankful to God. So what is he thankful to God about uh, uh, the believers at Rome? He's thankful to God about their uh, faith. Now, why is he thankful to God about their faith? We need to understand that the church at Rome uh, was being severely persecuted. Um, and like we said in the introduction, you know, this couple analysis and, uh, uh, sorry, Apollos and um, his uh, uh, his wife, you know, they come to Corinth uh, because of the edict that was um, uh, 
uh, passed by Claudius, uh, that all the Jews have to leave Rome. Uh, and we also see that when they go back, you know, uh, the church at Rome constantly uh, faced persecution. Um, and Paul heard about this and he continues to hear about their persecution. But in the midst of persecution, he hears about their faith. And he is just thanking God uh, for the faith that they have in the midst of their uh, persecution. And so here also we can learn that we can find things to thank God for the people we serve and minister to. Okay, look for things that we can thank God, uh, that we can praise God for uh, the people in our church, the believers uh, in our life group or in our Bible study group or our prayer group, um, and just thank God for, um, you know, for who they are and, you know, for God's work in their lives. What else did he thank God for? Okay, uh, in verse 9, he says, I'm praying for you and God is my witness. Okay. Um, so he continues to pray uh, for the church at Rome, um, and uh, he's saying, God is my witness. That means uh, he's saying, I'm not just writing it here for the sake of writing it. I'm praying for you, but I am actually really praying for you. And I want to point out uh, uh, this phrase in verse 9. It says, who I serve with my spirit. A very important uh, phrase that we can um, dwell on. Paul says, whom I serve with my uh, spirit. You know, when we serve God, we think about it as a physical work. You know, we think like I have to behave like this. And uh, when I go to church, I have to behave like this. I'm in this prayer group. I have to behave holy or I need to dress in a certain way. I have to preach in a certain way. I need to, um, uh, you know, have this style, this way of doing things, um, you know, speak these jargons, um, you know, uh, uh, show myself as holy and all of those things. Uh, so we are so focused on uh, doing God's work as something that is uh, uh, on the outside. Yes, it's important the way we dress, the way we behave, our attitudes, um, our actions, our reactions, all that is important. We're not undermining that. Uh, but Paul is saying that, you know, he wants to serve God with his spirit. He wants to say, I want to serve God with my spirit. Very interesting. You know, um, he's saying that I'm not just serving God with my body, but first I'm serving God with my spirit. Okay, so the question we need to ask ourselves is what is the condition of our spirit? Uh, you know, even as we are believers, maybe we are not apostles, we are not pastors, teachers, we're not in full time ministry, but it really doesn't matter because each one of us are called as priests. You know, we have uh, ushered into the kingdom of God, and as part of the kingdom of God, the sons and daughters of the kingdom of God, God has given us His dominion, His reign, uh, His rule, His government to be established here on earth. Uh, he's, we are the heirs with God, we are co heirs with Christ Jesus. Um, and uh, so we've been given all the authority and power to establish His kingdom here. And uh, the, uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is what is the condition of our spirit man? You know, when we serve God, it is the work of our spirit. It's not just the work of our bodies. Uh, it's the work of our spirit. So ministry work is spiritual work, uh, which our spirit is doing. Uh, just like, you know, uh, uh, we are part of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we are called to usher in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And it, uh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven has two dimensions, one the spiritual dimension and the one the, the other is a natural dimension. Uh, the time and the, uh, the you know, age that we are in right now, we are in the spiritual aspect, the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. But when Jesus comes again the second time and, you know, he, uh, you know, uh, uh, fights the battle of Amagodon and he overthrows all the rulers and the nations of this world and he establishes his physical kingdom here, the millennium kingdom uh, in Jerusalem, in uh, here, um, uh, in our midst, and we will all be part of God's physical kingdom, a thousand year rule. Uh, we will see the physical aspect of his kingdom. But presently, we are part of the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God and our ministry work is spiritual work and um, uh, the, 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 the anointing, the power, the authority uh, comes from the invisible 
uh, into our visible realm. So the invisible realm is God giving us a power and authority, which we see manifested in our um, visible realm. It also is uh, the authority and power that we receive is spiritual because God is a spirit being and uh, uh, you know, uh, the authority and power you give us is spiritual. So everything that we are doing uh, in ministry or you know, whether we are in business or whether we are in the secular field or whether we are just a housewife, whatever we are doing, we are actually building the kingdom of God and it's a spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. It's a work of our spirit. Um, it's a spiritual work because uh, it's the our spirit man is doing it. So we need to, to keep our spirit man in good shape. We need to keep it strong. Uh, we need to build up our spirit man. Like Paul says, don't feed the carnal nature. There is a, always a war between the flesh and the spirit uh, man. And he says, you need to feed your spirit uh, man and not your carnal nature. Okay. So uh, Paul is saying that, you know, um, uh, he serves God with the spirit that even as we, whatever we do, whether we do in ministry or secular work, uh, you know, we are serving, we are building the kingdom of God. We are, uh, you know, it's spiritual work our spirit is doing. So we need to keep our spirit man in good shape and, and strong. It's part of the spiritual work, he says, that, um, uh, you know, he's doing and he's saying, I'm praying for those uh, that I want to go and serve. So look at Paul's heart here. You know, uh, he's uh, not only desiring to go and meet the believers at Rome, but he's also praying uh, for those he wants to go and for those he wants to serve. So before we even go and minister to people, we need to pray for them. That's what we learn from here. You know, we need to pray for those we want to go and those we want to uh, serve. Okay, we move on to verse 10. Can somebody read verse 10, please? I'll read. Thank you. Making requests, if by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Thank you. Thank you. So part of that praying, Paul is saying that I want to go, I want to come and meet you and I want to uh, serve you. The KJV version says, making requests if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. So Paul is praying that he will have a prosperous journey, um, you know, by if it's God's will to come to you. But we see that his journey was, uh, you know, it was not even a prosperous one. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at history, we see what happens. You know, Paul uh, tells the church at Rome that he wants to go to Jerusalem uh, and he wants to give the saints uh, there, help them because there was severe famine. And then he wants to go to Spain. On his way to Spain, he wants to stop by at Rome. And uh, so we see that, you know, he wants to have a pleasant, prosperous journey. But when he was at the uh, uh, at Jerusalem, the Jews accuse him. We read about this in Acts chapter 22. And then, um, you know, he's um, uh, put in prison. He's taken to Caesarea, uh, where he's uh, taken by 20 Roman soldiers. And he's held in Caesarea as a prisoner for two whole years. And then, you know, Paul uh, uh, appeals to Caesar. And so since he appealed to Caesar, he has to come to Rome. So he's sent to Rome. And we know that he did not have a very prosperous, pleasant journey. Uh, they were stranded at sea for 14 days. Uh, they ended up in a shipwreck. And uh, they finally had to start, you know, land in, in, uh, at Malta, uh, where Paul got bitten by a viper. But he experienced no harm. We read about this in Acts chapter 23, 25, 20, chapter 28. Um, and then, you know, it takes three more months for him to sail. And when he arrives at home, he does not arrive as a free man. He arrives as a, a prisoner. Okay, And then he is put in uh, house arrest where he's given freedom to, you know, choose his, uh, have people come and meet him. So we see that even during his house arrest, you know, uh, Paul ministers to people who, who 
who came to him uh, and um, surely the believers were blessed and the church was strengthened. So really it was about three years after he writes this letter that Paul actually got to Rome and um, uh, he was brought there as a prisoner and he has a very difficult journey, but Paul was able to spend two full years at Rome and impart into the lives of the people and the believers of the church at Rome. Okay, so a lesson we can learn here is sometimes, you know, the journey itself may be very difficult. Uh, it might be very difficult for us to fulfill the will of God, um, uh, but success is not determined by our comfort or how easy is the journey but uh, it is about fulfilling the purpose of God. So, you know, Paul wanted to go and meet the believers at Rome. He wanted to have a pleasant, prosperous journey, but it did not happen that way. But that did not hinder him from, you know, doing what God wanted him to do and imparting into the lives of the believers at Rome. We look at, uh, we we'll progress, we we'll look, go on and we look at verses 11 and 12. Uh, Paul says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Okay, so Paul is saying that he longs to see the believers at Rome and impart to them some spiritual gift. We need to know that the church at Rome was not a baby church. Uh, as we saw in the in, in introduction, there were believers who were, uh, who were there at the, at the day of Pentecost and they came back to Rome and, and they, they preached the gospel and they established church. So uh, the day of Pentecost happened on uh, sometime on AD 13 and uh, when Paul is writing this, it was maybe AD 57, so almost uh, 27 years. So Paul is saying, I want to come and give you some spiritual things. Now, spiritual, he wants to impart spiritual gifts. Uh, spiritual gifts can be imparted and they can be trained. Uh, you know, some things of the spiritual, of the spirit realm can be caught, some things can be taught. Uh, so, impartation can happen in different ways. Um, one way we can impart is through sharing and teaching, uh, which is uh, what the word impart in Greek means to give a share of. Okay, uh, and it's the same word that is also used in Romans 12, verse 8, Ephesians 4, verse 28, and in Luke 3, uh, verse 11, where it says, if a man has two coats, let him give one to another who has none. So giving, sharing. So impartation can be about sharing and teaching. Impartation can also be, uh, impartation of spiritual gifts also could be, could be through association, or when we relate to people, when we associate with them, when we fellowship with them, uh, we can pass on from one person to the other. So Paul is saying that he's longing to see them and impart to them some spiritual gift so that he can encourage them and also be encouraged. Let's look at the humility of Paul. He's not saying, uh, you know, as an apostle, I'm in a position only to give, uh, to impart, uh, and, and I'm not somebody who receives because uh, what I receive is revelation from Jesus Christ. Uh, it's directly through him, through revelation. Uh, it's That's why I say it's my gospel. But we look at Paul's humility here. He's saying, I not only want to come and impart to you, but what I also want to receive. I also want to be encouraged myself. So as ministers of God, you know, um, we need to know what each one of us carries. Okay, um, we need to know that we have the grace of God. We need to know that we have the truth uh, in the word of God. And so each one of us carries something. Okay, we carry the truth of God's word in us, the revelation of God's word. We have the grace that is given to us to carry on, to fulfill God's purpose for our life. And you can carry, even as you carry something, uh, you know, make it your desire to give it out. To others. So whatever you're learning here in Romans as well, you know, you can use it to teach, to preach, to impart uh, to others. So Paul is intentional about what he's saying. He's saying, I'm carrying something and uh, I now want to impart that. I want to give it uh, uh, to you. So imparting to others uh, should also be something that is very intentional for us. Uh, it's not that we just keep on receiving, but we also um, Give okay, 
and uh, something that we can use to impart into the lives of Christians, believers, non-believers, to make them strong, secure, and established in the faith. We look at verses 13 to 15. Can somebody read verses 13 to 15, please? Verse 13, 15. Now, I do not want you to be unaware. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan, planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greek and to barbarian, both to wise and to unwise. So, as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Thank you. So this is the second time, you know, Paul is letting them know his desire that he wants to come and see them. Um, you know, even in our ministry, uh, we need to have this desire to do things uh, like Paul, he had a desire to go and minister to believers in various cities. We also need to desire to go and minister to people, to impart into their lives, to give uh, what we have received, the grace and truth that we have to impart into their lives. Um, and even as Paul, uh, you know, he plans to go and visit different people, different believers, different churches that he plans, uh, to, uh, that he has planted. Uh, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he says, The things I plan, do I plan them according to the flesh? Uh, which means Paul is saying that the plans that he makes to visit people, to write to them, uh, you know, uh, to to establish churches, it's not according to his own desire, it's not according to his flesh, but according to the Spirit. That means he's depending on the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we do, you know, even as we live our lives, uh, you know, we need to plan according to the Spirit, you know, whom to go to, where to go to, when to go, what to preach, what to say, constantly being uh, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. He says, I owe something uh, to these people. So what does he mean? Uh, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, uh, Paul uh, was a Jew, but he says that the Lord made him an apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, even though Paul was a Jew, you know, God made him an apostle to the Gentiles. So we see that God appoints certain people uh, to serve certain groups of people certain uh, uh, in certain geographical areas, uh, certain tribes, certain people groups, uh, tribal groups. And it's God who actually calls us and appoints us and gives us the mission. So the major part of the Gentiles were the Greeks. Um, and so that's why he mentions here, you know, uh, the Greeks who, uh, so the major part of the Gentiles were the Greeks. And uh, the people, the barbarians that he mentions are people who are not highly uh, educated. So Paul is saying that the call of God to minister or to be an apostle to, a gen, uh, to the Gentiles uh, makes, his, makes him indebted to God. That means he owes God something. God has called him, has given him something, so he owes God something. Why? Because God has appointed him, um, uh, you know, to the Gentiles, has appointed him to preach the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. So because God has appointed uh, you for them and you have to go and fulfill the call, a call to serve them, uh, you know, Paul is saying, I am indebted to God because I'm appointed by him, I'm called to go, I'm called to fulfill the call and I'm called to uh, serve them. So one way, uh, you know, uh, we are also indebted to God because we are called uh, to fulfill a certain uh, assignment that God has given to us, whether it's among children, youth, adults, 
you know, um, or people groups. Um, and we need to fulfill what God has called us to because we are debted to him. Uh, and how can we fulfill that? It's by going to the people of uh, people that God has asked us to go, uh, you know, to serve them, to minister to uh, them. And hence, Paul says he owes the people of Rome uh, something uh, because he's called to preach to them and hence he's ready to come to them and preach the gospel uh, to them. Verse 15, he says, so as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Paul goes on to say that this message of salvation uh, is something that he's ready to preach the gospel. He's uh, uh, ready to preach uh, to the people who are in um, Rome. Okay, in verse 16, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God with salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, this is a very powerful statement uh, that Paul makes. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of the message of the kingdom of God. He's not ashamed of the message of Jesus Christ. Um, and... Um, he says everything that he preaches and teaches is about Jesus Christ and, and, and about the kingdom of God. And he says it's the power of God for uh, salvation. Okay. And we know that salvation uh, is a very comprehensive word. Uh, it includes forgiveness of sins, healing, deliverance, wholeness, safety, uh, victory, uh, preservation from every harm and danger and everything else. So... Uh, you know, um, Paul is saying that, you know, everything that delivers us from sin and Satan is included in this word. So it's a power of God to salvation. And Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed because I know when I talk about God, when I talk about his kingdom, when I talk about his salvation, the power of God is made available to people to be saved uh, to be delivered, to be healed, uh, because it's a power of salvation uh, uh, that will take place in their lives, but that will save them, that will deliver them, that will heal them, and will set them um, free. Okay. Just before we close, uh, we look at verse 17. Uh, Paul says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by uh, faith. The New International Version says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, this is a very important verse because this verse gave birth to the Protestant Reformation or the Protestant movement. And uh, Martin Luther, you know, he drew inspiration from this verse. So this is a very monumental verse of the Protestant uh, faith. Uh, Paul is saying that the gospel is the gospel of righteousness of God and it's revealed from faith. Okay. And it says the righteous will live by faith or the just shall live by faith. Uh, he's quoting here from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. He said, you know, Paul uh, uses quite a, a lot of Old Testament scripture. So this is one place that he's quoting Old Testament scripture. Now in the Greek, the word for righteous, righteousness, just, justifier, justify, all have the same root word and hence they mean the same thing okay so paul is saying the fact that god is right that god is blameless uh, and the righteousness of god is revealed is unveiled from faith to faith and in the gospel he says we see the righteousness of god being imparted to the people of faith and that is how we become just or righteous Okay, and uh, so he's saying that in the gospel, the righteousness of uh, Jesus Christ is being revealed. And this righteousness is not just being revealed, but this righteousness is actually being given to us. And who can receive it? Those who receive it by faith. Okay, it's not by works. It is through grace. It's the grace of God that he gives us his righteousness and we receive it by faith. Okay, and when we receive this by faith, 
you know, uh, we just don't receive it, uh, but we also live by faith. Okay, we live by faith, we walk by faith, uh, and that is what he's meaning in these uh, verses. And this is what triggered Martin Luther's thinking of the gospel, which is the message of uh, grace uh, is unveiled to us in God's righteousness, and this righteousness is being given to people uh, who believe by faith or who receive it by faith. So he's saying that forgiveness of sins, uh, making us right in God's sight, justifying us before God, is not by um, uh, is not by repenting or confessing, just by repenting and confessing, or it's not by our deeds or our works, uh, you know, but it is by faith. Okay, so the righteousness of God is being revealed in the Gospels and it's been given to us and it's given to people who receive it by faith and we don't just receive by faith, we are then called on to live by faith. So how does a person who becomes just because of the righteousness of God that is imputed or put into his account um, uh, through the Gospel is... Um, that makes him just is that he begins to live by faith. So it is the grace of God, it is his righteousness that is being imputed or is being put in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is being put into our account, and we receive that by faith. Okay, so that is what he means uh, by this verse, which is very important. Um, the the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith and is written that the just shall live by faith. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, anyone has any questions, any doubts? I hope you have been following me. I was was I too fast? No? Okay. Kung and Asha says I was not fast. Thank God to have two in-person students. <laughs> Uh, was it okay? Uh, anyone has any questions? That's why it was okay. Thank you very much. God okay. bless you. Thank you. Third years are known to ask questions, so <laughs> I used to miss that. And I thought the last semester. You know, the book of Romans is so powerful, so we have to make more attention to listen to it very, very much. Yes, very true, because here he's talking more of doctrines, uh, teachings, it's very profound because uh, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, not only being ins uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but uh, as we said in the introduction, you know, Paul is very scholarly, uh, very uh, uh, scholarly in his understanding of the Old Testament, and he comes with a lot of logic and reasoning, um, and he presents the truth in a very profound way. And yes, uh, it's important for us to uh, uh, to listen again, uh, to learn, and to understand, because this is one of the most uh, important episodes where most of his talk we, we can understand most of the doctrines in a very profound, in-depth uh, way, yes. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Abhishek. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, thank you for uh, joining class. Have a blessed uh, day, and I will see you on Friday in the last half, and hopefully we'll finish uh, Romans chapter 1, and then we want to move to chapter 2. Okay, thank you everyone.